From the alley oop to Kizar to the glory days at the stick. From who's got it better than us to brick by brick. It's always the 49ers way from off season to game day. Yeah, we talk back. It's the 49ers cut back. It's 49ers Cutback Podcast time. Welcome to the show, everyone. The 53-man roster prediction. The 49ers have already waived five players as of yesterday. And as of today's recording, there has been no new news about who the 49ers are keeping on their active 53-man roster. But boy, is this one agonizing because this is a very talented roster and you could go a couple of different ways to be able to build it. And I think that's one thing I want to tackle in this episode is how the 49ers are going to approach this. This isn't going to be what I want. This is going to be what I think the 49ers are going to do. And I I went back and forth about how the 49ers feel about veteran players in certain positions, how they feel about young players. There's one thing I know for sure. No one knows exactly what John and Kyle are thinking. So this is an educated guess on exactly what the 49ers will do with the 53-man roster prediction. Do I think I'm going to be exactly right No, Uh, there's no way I can know the inner workings of all the contract situations, the way that Parag Marathi and uh, John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan go through uh, the things that have to do with salary cap. Also, just the way that they play on the field. But I think we can get a really good uh, build here on what the roster could look like. And uh, if you're watching for the first time, like and subscribe to the channel. I really appreciate it. If you're listening on 49ers Cutback on Believe, that's available on all audio platforms. Please give it a far five-star rating. I really appreciate everyone for doing that. So 53-man roster, and it, it gets really complicated really fast because when you go to the quarterback position, it was clear last week. Uh, last week, it was easy. I Brock Purdy, Sam Darnold, Trey Lance, hey, we're good. Uh, that got less clear this week. And then you throw in the fact that Kyle Shanahan sits at his press conference and he says that he doesn't know what they're going to do with the third quarterback. It all depends on how they plan on building this roster, which meant Brandon Allen's up in the air. And so it's not a guarantee that the 49ers keep a third quarterback. And this is where I go back and forth about how the 49ers build it. I think first off, they could easily go to Brandon Allen and and talk to him about you know being released and then coming back. Here's the problem with that. There are available opportunities around the league for Brandon Allen. Maybe even returning to Cincinnati where they're not very happy uh, with their backup situation. So you run the risk of losing Brandon Allen from your your roster if you release him. So that makes it a little bit difficult. So we know Brock Purdy. We know Sam Darnold. This is where I think the 49ers end up electing to keep three, even though there's a part of me that would have moved on from Brandon Allen and brought in another backup. I think the 49ers have just been bitten by the bug. They can't afford to lose a veteran quarterback at quarterback three and an experienced quarterback that had played a similar system in Cincinnati. So they go ahead and they keep Brandon Allen. And by keeping Brandon Allen, it's going to affect you later on when you get down the roster. And it does. You're probably going to put somebody at risk that you really don't want to put at risk. But that's one of the things you have to engage in when you're building a 53-man roster. So I have three quarterbacks on the active 53-man roster. Brock Purdy, Sam Darnold, and Brandon Allen. And boy, was Brandon Allen very difficult to do. But it's been a consistency for me to have three quarterbacks. It's just now it changed because Trey Lance was traded to the Dallas Cowboys. At the running back position, this one is very easy for me. Uh, Christian McCaffrey, Elijah Mitchell, Jordan Mason, Ty Davis Price, and Kyle Juszczyk. And even though we don't know exactly if Elijah Mitchell will end up on the IR or what will happen with him, we do know he's going to make the initial 53 because if you put him on the IR before the uh, initial 53 is determined that week one roster, then he would be out for the entire season. So we know that it's not going to happen. It's a tight adductor. Uh, So I expect Elijah Mitchell to be on this active 53-man roster, which means players like Jeremy McNichols, uh, Brian Hill, and of course, fullback Jack Coletto are going to uh, be moved on from. They're going to be cut. Uh, McNichols is going to be released. The other two waived. And with Jack Coletto, that means he's available to other teams to put in a waiver claim for him. And that would be unfortunate if the 49ers lost Jack Coletto. 
but I believe he's one of the most likely guys to be claimed because of the interest that was shown in him coming out of the draft. I think teams like the Denver Broncos see a lot of potential, and he did nothing to dissuade them from thinking that was the case, especially scoring a touchdown against Sean Payton and the Denver Broncos in the Week 2 preseason game. It's unfortunate, but Coletto could be moving on if he gets claimed. I'm hoping he ends up making it to the practice squad, but you just can't overtake Kyle Juszczyk in year one. After the 2023 season, there is a window to be able to move on from Kyle Juszczyk. That's where he has a little bit of a built-in roster thing. Uh, but right now, I just don't think that's a part of the case. So Coletto could be moving on. Unfortunate, good player. Uh, but when you have a talented roster like this, you're going to have to make really talented players available to other teams because you have to cut them. And it, it's difficult. At the wide receiver position, this is the part we've talked about. It has to be creative uh, because you got to keep certain guys on your roster. So we know Brandon Ayuk, Debo Samuel, and Jawan Jennings locks on this roster. That hasn't been anything uh, up in the air at all, at least for me. I thought those guys were very solid. Gregory McLeod has been out uh, for several weeks now with the broken wrist. Uh, there were conversations, Kyle Shannon talking, maybe he was going to be ready for week one. I think it's likely he's probably ready week three, week four, which means he doesn't have to go on the IR. With an IR stint, it's at least four weeks, so he would be out the first four games. So maybe Ray Ray McLeod you can carry on your active roster. He will for sure make it because, once again, you don't want his season to end. So Ray Ray's on there. And then I have Ronnie Bell, of course, making this roster. But I also have Danny Gray on the roster. And I think with Danny Gray, he is going to go on the IR. But I think it's going to happen after the initial 53-man uh, roster is uh, put into the league. And then they'll put Danny Gray on IR. And that'll free up a roster spot and take this back from six wide receivers to five. So I don't think the 49ers want to have six. Uh, it'll go down to five. They'll have to make other decisions later. Uh, but that's what they'll do, and that's how they'll get through missing Ray Ray McLeod and Danny Gray. They'll have those two guys. Plus, I think they will release Chris Conley. Once again, a release is different than a wave. If you if a player hasn't had four seasons in the league, they're not a vested veteran, then they can be uh, claimed on waivers. If a, if a player does have more than four seasons vested in the NFL, uh, then they can be just outright released. They can't get claimed by any team. They decide where they want to go. I think Conley gets released, and I would not be shocked as long as his shoulder checks out for the 49ers to bring him back onto this active roster. I know I said five wide receivers, but they might go six early on because of the injury to Ray McLeod. You don't really want to go into Pittsburgh with four. So that's a potential. And then I think Willie Sneed being on the practice squad uh, could give you that flexibility too. So no guarantee Conley comes back to the 53 because they could just ultimately decide to go Sneed on the practice squad and elevate him. But I think it got a little bit more interesting with the kicker situation, which we'll get into earlier, where you have to elevate a player potentially at kicker might not give you as many elevations as you want. You get two, you're using one on kicker. You're not able to potentially use one on a return guy like Sneed, even though I think that would take high priority. So six wide receivers through the gate, Brandon Ayuk, Debo Samuel, Jawan Jennings, Danny Gray, Ray Ray McLeod, and Ronnie Bell. Those would be the guys that I would think would keep it. So three quarterbacks, five running backs, six wide receivers, not a lot of room for other players on this roster. And with Cameron Latu's injury at tight end, I think Cameron Latu ends up going on season ending IR. I would have normally thought they would have got him to the 53, but I think this is an opportunity for a redshirt year. Cameron Latu is not ready to contribute to the 49ers uh, currently, but he could be next year. And this is kind of what they're doing with other positions as well. I think Latu to the IR makes sense. Torn meniscus, going to have surgery. You're going to need to move on from Cameron Latu for this season. Next year, you'll get him again. So I think Latu goes to the IR, and that kind of clears up this position a little bit because we've talked about in the past, Charlie Warner, uh, Ross Welly, who's going to make this team? I think it's George Kittle. It's Charlie Warner. He's going to be tied in too. And then I think it's going to be Braden Willis. And here's why. You don't want to lose Braden Willis. If, if, if you waive him, he could be claimed by somebody else. He's still a talented tight end and not bad on special teams. And the reason I'm doing that is because I have Ross Dwelly that I know keeps coming back to the 49ers over and over. You have a very good relationship with them. And this is exactly what they did with Tyler Croft last year. You go to Ross Dwelly, say, hey, we're going to cut you. Um, 
tomorrow we're going to uh, make some moves on the roster and we're going to bring you back. And I think Ross Dwelly would be a perfect you know, person to do that. Also, what you could do is just put Ross Dwelly on the practice squad. He hasn't got a lot of interest around the league. You put him on the practice squad and then you're able to elevate him week one. And then you have uh, Braden Willis being an active week one. And you have Ross Dwelly and Charlie Warner, who you've been very comfortable with as your tight end room heading into week one. You know exactly what to expect from them. Nothing you know, huge, nothing over the top, but it's going to take a little bit of time for your young tight ends to develop. This gives them that time to do it. Uh, so it, once again, interesting. If you put Dwelly on the practice squad, how many guys you can elevate. There wasn't a kicker situation. I think this would be real easy for the 49ers to navigate through. So three tight ends, Kittle, Warner, Braden Willis, with I believe Dwelly coming back in some form on the practice squad or on the active 53 once they've moved some people around. Offensive line is where it got agonizing for me. Uh, by keeping Brandon Allen, I knew I was going to have to lose an offensive lineman. And I didn't really, really like it, uh, to be honest with you, because I wanted to keep one, you know, a couple of guys as developmental, but it's not just not in the cards. You have a, a pretty good offensive line. And of course, we know who the top five guys are. Trent Williams, Aaron Banks, Jake Brendel, Spencer Burford, and Colt McKivitz. They all played good during the preseason. That's your starting unit. John Feliciano is the first guy in, in the interior. He did a really good job getting better and better as the preseason went on at center, especially in the third game. I thought he played uh, really good and comfortable in that position. Then you have Jalen Moore, and I have Jalen Moore making this roster. I was a huge fan of how he handled training camp. I thought he did a spectacular job at training camp. Uh, he did get the bone bruise, which hindered his pro progress a little bit. But I think we saw him progressively get better as he returned. So he didn't really do joint practices against the Raiders, but he played in the Raiders preseason game. Thought it was a little shaky, but still, I wasn't uh, really upset at him because I had seen what he had done. And then I heard Chris Furster talk about the fact what he wasn't really all the way healthy yet. I thought in the Broncos game, he played a little bit better than he played in the Raiders, which that's what I'm looking for, consistency, growth. And then I thought in this game against the Chargers, he really showed what he's capable of doing. Feel really comfortable about Jalen Moore being the left tackle option behind Trent Williams, which is a good sign because they didn't really do anything with Matt Pryor going over and playing any left, which kind of puts me into this category where I have Matt Pryor making the roster as well. The way he played in Denver, the way he played with the Chargers, uh, it, it made me feel really good about him, and it made me feel good about them having left and right uh, tackles for the way they're building this thing out. Now, this is where it got hard. By keeping Brandon Allen, I lost Nick Zakel. And I know a lot of people are going to talk about how bad he was during the preseason and all of that stuff. But he was the next best interior offensive lineman uh, for the 49ers that's not named Feliciano because of versatility to play left and right. I, I think that he was going to, I think he is going to develop into a good player. But this could be the Colton McKivitz moment for Nick Zakel. Uh, Colton McKivitz, of course, in 2020 was waived. He was a fifth round pick, picks a Kell a sixth round pick. And he cleared waivers. He went on the 40 yards practice squad, developed, and eventually they called upon him to come back up and make an impact. I think that could be the avenue for Nick Zakel. I'll be clear. I did not want to waive Nick Zakel. I would love to have nine offensive linemen, and I just wanted to have that depth. I wanted two guys on the interior, two guys on the outside for every game they go in. I thought about messing with the idea of releasing Matt Pryor with the thought that you could sign him the next day to get Zakel, you know, through uh, waivers. But I think you might be able to get Nick Zakel through waivers now. We'll see. Uh, this offensive line in the NFL is a little weird right now, but I think that you could find a creative way if you really have to. But I felt that with the way that the team is built right now, Pryor played really good. Jalen Moore played really good. Uh, you have a very veteran group right there. I think that this could be the way they go. I think they would like to keep Nick Zakel within the organization at some point. I think I have seen growth in him from last year, which is always important. It's only in year two as a six-round pick. So we'll see if he ends up making it to the practice squad. I would say this was one of the ones I agonized over with the idea of Brandon Allen making the roster. I knew I was going to lose an offensive lineman, and I didn't want to lose Matt Pryor because I have seen such good improvement from him. He's developed in the run game. Uh, so this was an interesting one. This is one that I'm not 100% on. I could see Matt Pryor being the release and then them bringing him back. I could also see the 49ers electing to keep nine offensive linemen and Pryor and Zakel joining Moore and Feliciano in that group. So 
Uh, definitely not dead set on it, uh, but this is the way I played it out right now. So it's offensive line, eight guys, uh, Trent Williams, Aaron Banks, Jake Brendel, Spencer Burford, Colton McKivitz, John Feliciano, Jalen Moore, and Matt Fryer. So that's the offense, 25 offensive players. So pretty much an even split. You go 25 on offense, 25 on defense, and then you have the three specialists. And that's how I elected to go with this one. Sometimes it'll go 26 offensive players. Sometimes it'll go you know, 24 defense or vice versa, depending on where they need to keep the most talent. And this is definitely not an exact science, but I think 25 offensive players was a nice round number. If the Forty elect to go two quarterbacks, it's going to free up a, a roster spot on offense, and I completely expect it to end up being an offensive lineman. Uh, so maybe they would go that route, or maybe they could flip it to the other side. So let's start with defensive line. First off, Bosa does not count against the 53-man roster right now unless he signs be, before Tuesday at 1 p.m. Uh, at, until then, he is considered on the, the reserved uh, holdout list. So he is an exempted player. He doesn't count against your 53. So let's go ahead and get him out of the category, which I had been putting him in my 53-man roster predictions because I expected him to be signed. But here we are. It's not done. Hopefully it happens Wednesday, and they just make a corresponding move after that and get it done. So defensive line is a little bit difficult, but let's go with the defensive tackles first. Uh, Javon Hargrave, Eric Armstead, Javon Kinlaw, and Kevin Givens. And I know there's only four. But here's why. I fully plan on having Marlon Davidson, T.Y. McGill, and Kalia Davis, uh, a couple of those three on our practice squad. And I don't know if Kalia Davis would end up getting claimed by the Texans. They did play him in the last game, uh, which means I don't think they're too concerned. Either they're going to keep him on the roster or they're not really concerned about him clearing waivers. So I think Kalia Davis could be an option for the 40 yards practice squad. The health issue's always been something. And then I think you keep one of the veterans. And I think Marlon Davidson outplayed T.Y. McGill. So I think that is a possibility there. But the reason that I wasn't able to keep a fifth interior defensive lineman, even though I think one, uh, you know, they would like to have five, is because you do have other players with that versatility to play inside if needed from the edge. And I think the Warriors are going to make a roster move once this is fully decided. Once I go through defensive ends, I'll kind of uh, illustrate how. So at defensive end, I got starter Cleveland Farrell. I got Kerry Hyder, and, and he was a guy that I've I've circled as a possibility of them going to him and saying, "Hey, Kerry, we need we need to release you. We'll bring you back tomorrow." And I think he would do it. So if they needed to free up a roster spot, they could do that. So keep that in mind if you see Kerry Hyder get released. He's a player I circled. I just went ahead and kept him because with Bosa being on the reserve list, I just didn't need to free up an extra spot. I would love to. I could have kept Nick Zakel, right? Uh, but I don't know if they'll do that because I don't want to lose Kerry Hyder. But we'll see. His relationship with Coach Chris Kassarek could allow them to do that. And then I have uh, Austin Bryant and Robert Beal. And Robert Beal is one of the most interesting guys because he barely practiced at all uh, that we were able to see when we were out at training camp. And then when pads came on, he wasn't available until right before our, yeah, right before the Broncos game. And we heard that he had some good reps against Trent Williams. Uh, then he practiced the next week, but he never played in any games. So the thought process here is one or two things. The 49ers are either going to shut this guy down and put him on IR before the season starts, or they didn't want anyone to see him because they plan on, they're just going to, they're going to act like he was hurt the entire time. They're going to go on to the, they're going to put him on the 53 and then they're going to put him on IR afterwards. And because he had the injury, right? That's how they justify it. So Robert Beal Jr. I think is a guy that's available for IR I think when it comes to edge rushers, they definitely would prefer that he makes the active roster and then put him on IR because if you do that, uh, he's available to come back during the year. And if you suffer some injuries at defensive end or Nick Bosa continues his holdout late into the season, you might want to bring him back in. Uh, so I think that he's he's an interesting piece that the four years are going to have to figure out what to do. I put him on the active roster with full intentions of putting him on the IR after that and freeing up a roster spot for somebody else, whether that's another edge rusher that they bring back or they sign somebody that got released like a Terrell Basham or someone like that. Uh, maybe they make another move to clear things up or could be as simple as Robert Beal goes to the IR, Nick Bosa signs, no harm, no foul. You got your, your guys figured out. So uh, that's how I have it. So I have nine guys as of right now on the defensive line. 
I think the 49ers would like to have it at 10, uh, but you know, with some movement, they can make some things happen. Uh, Javon Hargrave, Eric Armstead, Drake Jackson, Cleveland Farrell, Kerry Hyder, Javon Kinlaw, Kevin Givens, Austin Bryant, and Robert Beal. And I know a lot of people won't have Bryant, but I thought his play has been superb, and he deserves to be on this roster. At linebacker, one of the most talented locations on the entire 49ers defense. Of course, Fred Warner, Dre Greenlaw are locks. They've been locks. Uh, I've, I've always thought those two guys are just special, and they, they really have proved it over the last several years. And then the third linebacker is Oren Burks. And some people have you know kind of gave me a pushback about Oren Burks over you know, the offseason, but I believe Oren Burks is going to start at Sam linebacker. And the way that uh, Steve Wilkes goes about defense, the odds of uh, Burks playing a lot of snaps aren't good. I mean, he's talked about, you know, in, in 12 personnel playing a, a big nickel. So I think Oren Burks is going to play Sam linebacker. He's going to play about 20%, 20, 25% of the snaps. And he put out some really good tape last year, playing for the same coach in the same scheme. As far as uh, Johnny Holland, I think he understands what he's supposed to do. He had a, a sprained knee through part, most of training camp, came back for the Raiders scrimmage and re-aggravated but I don't think they're really concerned about him. I think they're gonna they're planning on starting him. I think he's gonna make this roster. So he's your Sam linebacker starting day one against the Pittsburgh Steelers. He gets to deal with Najee Harris. Then after that, I went three young guys, and this could easily go a different way. They could easily go with Demetrius Flanagan Fowles and two young guys and try to get somebody you know to the practice squad. But I decided to go with three. I thought the emergence of Jalen Graham was really solid. Uh, D. Winters flew around and make plays, and Marcelino McCurry Ball, I think, is right there on the fringe. I do believe the 49ers could wave one of these young guys and potentially get them to their practice squad and keep DFF. That happens, I won't bat an eye because DFF is so good on special teams, and you know that if Oren Burks wasn't available week one, you wouldn't have to start a rookie at linebacker. So if they check the boxes on Oren Burks, DFF might end up either on another football team or on the 49ers practice squad, which I would love to retain him on the practice squad. But if I had to guess, and this is this is tough to say, I would think the 49ers could release could end up waving one of those young players and keeping DFF. But right now I kept the young players. I didn't want to lose the talent. I've seen the development from McCurry Ball. I've seen the flashes of D winners. I don't want to lose that. And Jalen Graham is definitely flashed at stopping the run. There's some definitely areas those guys need to get better. Um, but to me, it, you just can't pass up on keeping the young talent in your room. So six linebackers, Fred Warner, Dre Greenlaw, Oren Burks, those are your starters, uh, Jalen Graham, D. Winters, and Marcelino McCurry Ball, and whatever order you have them on the depth chart, that's up to you. I think D. Winters, Graham, and McCurry Ball also will develop into very solid special teams, uh, but if they're equal, you know, if you got a Marcelino McCurry Ball and uh, Johnny Holland says, hey, he's equal with DFF, uh, that's when Coach Brian Snyder can come in and say, well, DFF is a better special teams player. I would elect to go that way if we can. Sometimes you'll see a, a, a younger player moved on from. I hope that doesn't happen in this case. Uh, but, you know, both guys are on a one-year deal. Mercury Bowl's on a one-year deal. And so is, um, you know, a, a guy like DFF. So six guys at, at linebacker, six guys at cornerback as well. So, your, your top two guys, easy to figure out. Charvarius Ward, uh, Diameter Lenore, those guys are going to be banning the outsides, at least during your base sets. When you go to your sub packages, your nickel and so on, it looks like Diameter Lenore is going to be moving in. And because he's moving in and the 49ers in the week three preseason game decided to give Ambry Thomas the day off, I'm guessing that means Ambry Thomas is the third cornerback. And so uh, that means he's going to play outside. Lenore is going to move in as the, you know, base nickel that was very interesting to me but I mean they did like Ambry Thomas in 2021 uh they used a third round pick he played pretty well in the playoffs it looks like that's the way they're gonna go Ambry Thomas Mooney Ward and then Demo's gonna be the guy that plays outside and moves inside depending on situation when they're in sub packages so what does that mean for the rest well I think Sam Womack played well enough during the preseason to secure himself a roster spot I think he is the, the next guy in on the outside, with Ambry being the first guy in, I think Womack is the next one. I would argue that Womack played better uh, during the preseason than Ambry Thomas did, but I thought Ambry Thomas's development was definitely on display. He looked in more command 
of what his expectations were is what they expected from him, but also just understanding route concepts, uh, undercutting plays. I thought he looked really good. And the big thing with him was always he gave up too much cushion, too much space, and then they would beat him underneath. When in college, he was more of a press coverage guy. But I think there's been some development there, and I like where Ambry Thomas is headed. So uh, it, it's it's interesting. I want to see how it develops, but I'm hoping it works out. Wilkes is a definite DB guy, and he's been high on Ambry Thomas since he first came there and started talking up Thomas, talking up Womack. I think that's good news uh, for the 49ers. And then after that, it goes to Sean Jamison. I think Deshaun Jamison's going to make this team. His versatility to play inside and out is, is well-documented, but they've primarily played him on the outside. They practiced him a little bit at nickel, but he's mainly going to be on the outside, and he's been very sticky in coverage. Not a lot of space, had a couple of pass breakups, but really not a lot of throws going his way, which means he's not giving up any ground. Quarterbacks don't feel comfortable throwing on him. But his smoothness and the way that he's the way he backpedals, the way he changes direction, the way he drives on the football, uh, just the fluidity of his in his hips and everything. To me, it looks like he's a a player that could develop into something special down the road. So I think the four yards definitely want to hold on to him. And my question marks what with him was more about how he was going to do in the run fits. And early on, I seen him set the edge really well. Then I had concerns about him whenever it would get to like oh, the cornerback has to have D-gap or the, the cornerback has to come up there and stick his nose into something on the backside for a cutback. And then he was a little hesitant, didn't always get where he was supposed to get. I thought he improved on that in this last game. He was physical. He was flying around making tackles and still had the sticky coverage. Uh, to me, he's somebody the 49ers don't want to lose. They can't run the risk of putting him on waivers because he would get snatched up, I believe. I think he's done enough to show the rest of the league and put enough good film out there for them to understand how good of a football player that Deshaun Jameson could be. I'm not saying he's great right now, but he's definitely trending in the right direction. I think they might have hit on another undrafted free agent at corner. We'll see how he develops. He'll have some concerns about being five foot nine. You know, 190 pounds. Like, what's going to happen when he goes against a TK or a DK Metcalf or some of the big receivers like AJ Brown in this league? Those will be concerns. Uh, but right now, we don't have to worry about that. He's more of a depth piece that can help on special teams as well, whether that's as a gunner or returning kicks or punts. I think early on in the season, Willie Sneed or Ronnie Bell handle that. Willie Sneed would be uh, the player that I would go with. But we'll see what what Brian, Coach Brian Snyder decides. And then. The sixth cornerback that I end up keeping is Isaiah Oliver. And a lot of people are not going to keep Isaiah Oliver on their 53-man roster, but this is what I believe the 49ers are going to do. And I thought I've seen enough good film. I saw him flash a little bit in this last game with some of the tackling ability that I think that he will play better with the sum of parts around him. What I'm saying is when you get players like Ufonga, Tashawn Gibson, uh, you get the linebacker group like Dre Greenlaw and Fred Warner, and they are, and then you get defensive linemen that are setting the edge really well. It's going to keep players off of Isaiah Oliver, and he's going to look better than what he looked like during the preseason. But I will say this. They gave him a deep, long run in the Raiders game and in the Chargers game. They let him play a lot of snaps. They're definitely evaluating him. But I think some of the things Wilk said make me believe Oliver ends up making this roster, and I think they use him uh, covering tight ends, covering big receivers, which he was doing in the game against the Chargers. Yes, he got the pass interference. That was a little ticky-tack for me. A lot of people hated it. I see cornerbacks do that all the time. The, the only thing he needs to do is get his hand lower. So technique-wise, technique point for Steve Wilkes, not so much that he had contact, it's where he had contact. And a lot of people get upset. Oh, he, he, he held on to him. He put his hi hand on his hip. There's no call in that play. They don't call holding. So all they're going to do is they're going to work on his technique, getting his hand down, putting it on the defenders or on the offensive player's hip, and that'll take away that penalty. So those things I don't get hypercritical about. If he becomes a re repeat offender and he's always getting penalties because he's not doing the right technique, then I'll have a concern. But I don't think right now is the time to move on from Isaiah Oliver with the way that the, the financials look. Uh, the salary cap impact, but also you can still use him in big situations with big wide receivers in the slot and tight ends. And I think that's what Steve Wilkes envisions. If you have the roster spot to do it, go do it. He talked about the flexibility. In fact, you can go listen to the episode I did about the double nickel uh, and go look, just go listen to the thing Steve Wilkes said and then kind of my commentary on it and you'll get an idea of what it looks like Steve Wilkes is trying to do there. So uh, those guys make a lot of sense. 
Then, of course, Darrell Luter Jr. is on the pup list. They're not going to have to do anything. They can just keep him on the pup list because he started camp on the pup list. So they have him. They can they can bring him back at any time, or they can redshirt him throughout the entire year. So that's probably the likelihood for Darrell Luter Jr., him, Cameron Latu, uh, Taylor Hawkins, who broke his hand, probably going to be IR or in, ta- uh, in Darrell Luter Jr.'s uh, pup list. Uh, he's going to stay on there the rest of the year. So safety position. You got four safeties. Deshaun Gibson, Talano Ufonga. Those are your starters. Those are the number, you know, top guys. Jair Brown, you drafted. You're not moving on from him. He was a you traded up to get him in the third round. He's looked good. He needs some development. He needs some maturing. Uh, but you've got somebody like you got to feel confident in, right? He's not flashing like Ufonga did in his rookie season yet. Uh, but Jair Brown's got a lot to like, and I think he can develop into a starter potentially by 2024. So I think you're happy with him. And then you got George Odom. And I know Odom didn't play during the preseason and he's been hurt, uh, but they've said he's going he's gonna to be on, on target for week one. I think that's the the, poss- the capabilities. He'll be back for week one. And if he is, he's going to be there, but he's definitely going to be on the active 53 man roster because they can't afford to lose him. So if he's on the 53, they can figure something out. If he's not healthy, maybe you, Elevate a player like Quantrez Knight if you sign him to the practice squad, which I believe the 49ers want to do and will do. Get Quantrez to the practice squad, and then you could elevate him if necessary. I would have said Taylor Hawkins before that, but Hawkins has a broken hand. He's probably going to be on IR or waived. I could eventually end up on the 49ers practice squad once he's healed. So I think the safety room is one of those rooms that's easy. And then specialists, you got Jake Moody, you got Mitch Wisnowski, you got Tabor Pepper. And when it comes to Jake Moody, he's going to be on the active 53-man roster, depending on where he's at with his quad. If he's going to be out several weeks, they will place him on IR, and they will uh, make another move with a kicker. I think the likelihood is the 49ers go ahead, they keep Moody active, they sign a kicker to their practice squad. Uh, By signing the kicker to the practice squad, if Moody's not able to play at Pittsburgh, they elevate that kicker for that game. If Moody is able to play, then what they do is they leave that kicker on the practice squad. They don't elevate him and they elevate two players that they want to use at other positions that make more of an impact. So that gives you that flexibility. And with the amount of kickers that are available out there, you don't have to go get a big player. If this was season ending, yes, go out and try to sign Robbie Gold or go out and try, try to sign Michael Badgley or one of these experienced kickers. But you don't have to do that. You can go get a you know, a Rodrigo Blankenship and put him on your practice squad or, you know, whoever else is going to be available out there. I think with Zane Gonzalez getting hurt as well, he was going to be the practice squad guy. He probably would have been kicking in Pittsburgh. They gave Moody some time, uh, but it's going to all be kind of playing and seeing how it goes. Uh, so to me, uh, this is how the roster plays out. Am I 100% confident in it? No, because I think there's some decisions to be made about Brandon Allen, uh, some decisions to be made about the wide receiver position, and defensive line where they've got to sign up, decide on players like Clea Davis and Robert Beal. And it could make players available to other teams. Uh, what you're hoping is that they're focused on bringing back their own players. And with there being one cut going from now the 40 yards from 85 down to 53 and other teams doing the same sort of thing that it's going to kind of put so many guys out there that you're just going to be able to retain your players. So uh, the 53-man roster prediction is not an exact science. It's an educated guess. Hope you guys all enjoyed the episode. Like and subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on 40 Yards Cutback on Believe. Uh, go ahead and give it a five-star rating. I really appreciate that. You guys are the best. Uh, we'll see what happens. I'm going to go live to talk about the 49ers 53-man roster when it gets announced on Tuesday. Of course, if you're on an audio platform, it's going to go up shortly after I record. If you're over on YouTube, join me live and we'll get a nice conversation going as the 49ers make decisions about their 53-man roster. And once it's decided, we'll break it all down, go through you know, the things that happen with the 53-man roster, uh, how every room shakes out, and then it's just a matter of time. We go from breaking down roster and talking 49ers the way they built it to getting to Pittsburgh. I can't wait for that. That's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait for next week where there's a lot of cool content coming your way. Hope you guys will join me for all of it. I'll catch you guys on the next one. Until then, stay safe and remember the right way is always the 49ers way.